I pull up to the front of the old New England house, the final destination on a journey that started weeks ago. The transition has been a mix of chaos and anticipation. A new job in a new city meant I had to find a new home, too. When I saw this listing, affordable, secluded, and oozing with historical charm, I couldn't resist. The wooden panels, stone chimney, and quaint gardens spell a welcome change from the cramped city apartment I used to call home. I guess this is it, I say to myself, turning off the ignition and stepping out of the car. The air is crisp, carrying scents of pine and damp earth. I retrieve the key from the lockbox and open the front door, which groans a little, as though waking up from a long nap. Inside, the air smells musty, but that's to be expected from a house that's been standing for more than a century. I do a quick tour to reacquaint myself with the layout. Hardwood floors creak under my boots, and the wallpaper has seen better days, but that's fine. A little wear and tear adds to the character. The living room and kitchen are downstairs, the bedrooms are upstairs, and then there's the attic, an expansive, shadowy space that I didn't pay much attention to during the initial house tour. Back in the living room, I glance at the stack of boxes that the movers left. They contain my life in corrugated cardboard, clothes, books, kitchen supplies, and an assortment of other items that I've collected over the years. I should start unpacking, but the attic keeps nudging at my thoughts. Better see what's up there, I decide, grabbing a flashlight from one of the boxes marked Essentials. I head up the narrow staircase leading to the attic. The wooden steps creak with each footfall, and when I reach the top, I click on the flashlight. Dust particles dance in the beam as I scan the room. The attic is filled with an assortment of forgotten things, old furniture, suitcases, and random knickknacks. It's a storage space that time forgot, filled with items that the previous owners probably meant to sort through but never did. A sigh escapes my lips. This looks like it will be a bigger cleaning project than I'd anticipated. That's when I notice it, a dusty box, slightly hidden behind an old rocking chair, its presence almost whispering for attention. I wonder what's in here, I say to myself as I pull the box closer its edges frayed with age. I lift the lid. Inside, there's an assortment of items that seem to have been collected over many years. Old coins are piled in one corner, their faces worn but still discernible. A tarnished silver locket lies beside them, its clasp rusted shut. On the other side of the box, there are yellowed letters, each one folded neatly and tied with a brown, brittle string. But what really grabs my attention is at the very bottom of the box, a stack of leather-bound journals. Their covers are tarnished with age, but otherwise in good condition. I pick one up, feeling its weight in my hands. The leather cover is textured and well-preserved despite the years. Opening it cautiously so as not to damage the binding, I find an inscription on the first page. It reads, Journal of Elias, Witch Hunter. My eyebrows shoot up in surprise. At this point, curiosity is driving me. I need to know what's inside. So I carry the journals downstairs to my living room. I sit down on my plush gray couch, placing the journals on the coffee table for a moment as I adjust the cushions behind me. Finally settled, I pull the first journal onto my lap and open it to the first page. The paper is thick and slightly discolored with age, but the ink is still legible. March 5th, 1670. My name is William, born and raised in a small village in New England, a place where traditions hold fast and fears run deep. I come from a line of farmers, a simple life, but it was enough for us. That was until two winters ago, when our village was struck by a tragedy that would set me on an entirely different path. That winter, Crops failed, livestock died inexplicably, and an illness swept through the village, affecting the young and old alike. People started whispering, saying it was unnatural, that something or someone was behind it. I remember the chilling evening when they found Mrs. Thompson, the healer, hanging from an oak tree, lifeless. Her death was a symbol, a declaration that the village had given into its deepest fears, witchcraft. 
Mrs. Thompson was a kind woman who had helped deliver half the children in the village. She taught me about medicinal plants when I was a boy, skills that were merely interesting then but have become essential now. To think she was accused of witchcraft and met such a terrible end was both horrifying and awakening. It was a jolt to my system, telling me that ignorance, combined with fear, could result in unspeakable acts. I couldn't just stand by and watch as the village succumbed to paranoia and began pointing fingers, accusing innocent souls of consorting with the devil. It became evident to me that something needed to be done, but in a way that was rooted in understanding rather than blind fear. So I decided to set out and seek knowledge, to understand the true nature of witches, whether they were evil beings deserving of our fear or simply misunderstood individuals that could be dealt with in a less barbaric way. I spent months traveling, learning from scholars, priests, and even suspected witches who were willing to share their side of the story. I acquired books and manuscripts that taught me the history of witch hunting, the signs of witchcraft, and methods for confronting witches. I trained in combat, knowing that I might have to defend myself and others from magical threats. I wanted to be prepared, for I had decided to become a witch hunter. Becoming an apprentice to Nathaniel was my final step. He was a seasoned witch hunter who had been in the business for decades. While some of his methods were controversial, he knew the craft well, and he could teach me things that books and travels couldn't. Under his guidance, I aimed to become a different kind of witch hunter, one who would bring reason and discernment to a trade often guided by hysteria. My goal is not just to hunt witches, but to understand them, to distinguish between those who mean harm and those who don't, and to apply justice where it is truly deserved. I strive to be the change, to bring about a new era in witch hunting that doesn't involve mindless persecution, but focuses on the true protection of the innocent. Today is the day I take on the role of a witch hunter for the first time. The weight of the responsibility rests heavy on my shoulders as I prepare to leave with Nathaniel, my mentor. The atmosphere is thick with tension as we gather our supplies. Swords sharpened to a fine edge, leather-bound books containing crucial knowledge about witchcraft, and small pouches filled with various herbs and substances known for their efficacy against witches. Nathaniel, with his severe expression and penetrating gaze, turns to me and questions my commitment. William, are you sure you want to do this? His voice is deep, filled with years of experience and caution. I look back at him, trying to project as much confidence as I can muster. I am, I assert. Our villages are under threat. Witches are causing harm and sowing chaos. Someone has to take action. He nods, apparently satisfied with my answer. Very well. Make sure your horse is well fed and ready for the journey. We have a long ride ahead of us. We're heading to Eastwick, where there are rumors of witch activity. I ready my horse, checking the saddle and bridle. The animal senses the urgency in the air and stomps its hooves impatiently. I mount and join Nathaniel, and together we ride out as the first hints of dawn break over the horizon. The sky turns from a deep navy to lighter shades of blue signaling the start of a new day and, for me, a new life. The ride to Eastwick is quiet, each of us lost in our own thoughts. Nathaniel finally breaks the silence when the village comes into view, its small thatched cottages appearing innocent enough but hiding a web of fear and rumors. Listen carefully, William. Once we get there, we need to gather information. We'll ask the villagers about any strange occurrences but we must do so carefully. These people are terrified. The last thing they need is more reason to panic. I take in Nathaniel's instructions, understanding the delicacy of our mission. Fear can spread like wildfire, especially in small, tight-knit communities like Eastwick. A misplaced word or accusation could send the villagers into a frenzy, making our job even more difficult. Remember, Nathaniel adds as we approach the village entrance. Our aim is to protect these people, not to become another source of their fear. Let's go about this the right way. With that, we enter Eastwick, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead.
we arrive at the village square, a focal point of community activity. Nathaniel guides his horse toward a well where a group of men are engaged in conversation. They look serious, their faces lined with concern. I steer my horse in the opposite direction, toward a woman who is quickly walking with a basket full of apples. Her pace suggests she wants to get to market and back home as quickly as possible. Good morning, ma'am, I say, offering a friendly yet respectful greeting as I dismount. Morning, she responds, her eyes looking everywhere but at me, clearly uneasy. Aware of her nervousness, I get straight to the point. I don't mean to alarm you, but have you noticed anything out of the ordinary recently? Anything that seems odd or unsettling? She stops for a moment, glances around to ensure no one is within earshot, and leans in. People are talking about a witch, she whispers, but that's as much as I know. People are scared to say more. I give her a nod, thanking her for the information. She hurries off, likely eager to leave the topic and the square behind her. I make my way back to Nathaniel, who is concluding his discussion with the men by the well. He turns toward me, his eyes searching mine for any clue of what I discovered. Any useful information? He asks, keen to compare notes. Some, I respond. The woman I spoke to mentioned rumors of a witch, although she didn't offer specifics. Nathaniel nods, appearing neither surprised nor relieved. Same here. The men suggested that if there is a witch, she's likely to be near the old mill in the forest. Let's investigate. We guide our horses out of the square and move toward the edge of the village where the forest begins. The trail leads us to an old mill, its wooden structure weather-beaten and aged. It's almost noon, yet the air around the mill feels unnaturally cold. A stiff wind picks up, causing the decrepit wheel attached to the mill to emit a long, drawn-out creak. Nathaniel dismounts and looks at me. We should cover more ground quickly. I'll go through the front entrance. You circle around the building and check the surroundings. Keep your sword ready and be on your guard. I nod, unsheathing my sword from its leather scabbard. The steel glints in the scarce sunlight that manages to filter through the dense canopy of trees. As Nathaniel walks cautiously toward the front door of the mill, I start making my way around the building, every sense heightened, aware that the situation could turn dangerous in an instant. Suddenly, I hear a commotion inside. My heart races as I sprint to the front of the building and kick open the door. Inside, I find Nathaniel locked in a struggle with a woman. Her appearance is unsettling. Her eyes are pitch black, devoid of any white or iris. This immediate and unusual detail validates our suspicion that she is a witch. Without hesitation, I jump into the melee. With my sword in hand, I aim carefully, avoiding Nathaniel while trying to disarm the woman. She fights back vigorously, displaying unnatural strength, but the two of us working in tandem eventually overpower her. Nathaniel swiftly produces a length of rope from his belt and binds her hands tightly to ensure she can't cast any spells. As he finishes tying the knots, a moment of doubt overtakes me. Nathaniel, are we doing the right thing? I ask. Nathaniel looks up. We're doing what's necessary, he replies. His tone leaves no room for further questioning. It's a simple yet weighty answer, sealing the gravity of our actions. We lead the bound woman out of the mill, making our way back through the forest towards the village. Nathaniel rides ahead, clearly focused on the task at hand, while I follow behind, my thoughts racing. The phrase, what's necessary, loops in my mind. In this grim and perilous duty of witch hunting, maybe that's the best one can aim for, to do what's essential for the greater good of the community, even if the individual cost is high, morally or otherwise. Despite my reservations, a part of me recognizes that action had to be taken. Villagers are living in fear, and our role is to protect them. As we approach the village, I realize that this is a point of no return. Time passes, and my training under Nathaniel becomes increasingly intense. Every day is a new lesson in tracking witches, deciphering spells, and mastering interrogation techniques. 
It's not just about physical training. Nathaniel makes sure to equip me with the psychological tools I need to handle the emotional strain that comes with this role. Our overarching goal is simple, yet vital. Safeguard the innocent from the corrupting influence of witches. Nathaniel is a demanding teacher, expecting nothing less than my best effort. However, he balances his sternness with fairness, praising my progress while clearly outlining what I need to improve upon. Then comes the news of a witch menacing the village of Hargrove. Unlike our previous assignments, this case seems particularly challenging. The witch, Eliza, is not a newcomer to the world of dark magic. She has a reputation for being cunning and has successfully evaded capture in the past. Known for causing extensive famine through her curses, Eliza poses a direct threat to the livelihood of the entire village. After gearing up, Nathaniel and I ride out to Hargrove. Our horses maintain a steady gallop, covering the ground quickly as we leave the familiarity of our town behind. As we draw nearer to Hargrove, the evidence of Eliza's malevolence becomes increasingly apparent. Fields that should be lush and green at this time of the year are instead barren and brown. Patches of land that once yielded abundant crops now lie empty, incapable of supporting any form of life. It's a sobering sight, and it amplifies the urgency of our mission. Entering Hargrove, it's immediately clear that the village is gripped by a sense of hopelessness. People move about their daily chores with lethargic movements. Their faces are a mask of worry and despair. Conversations are few, and laughter is entirely absent. This isn't just a community struggling with economic hardship. These people are fighting for their lives, and losing. With Eliza's curse suffocating the land, the clock is ticking on how long these villagers can hold out before they're entirely broken. The weight of our task becomes heavier with each step we take, as we understand that failure is not an option. Eliza is more clever than most witches we've dealt with. We need to be on our toes, Nathaniel states, eyeing the village square as we dismount from our horses. We divide our efforts, aiming to cover more ground in a shorter amount of time. The square is filled with people who show obvious signs of distress. I can see the apprehension in their eyes. It's as if they are sizing me up. I walk up to a farmer who is attempting to extract some utility from the land, but his actions appear futile given the soil's current state. Good day, sir, I greet him, striving to keep my tone light. The fields are not yielding much, are they? A heavy sigh escapes his lips as he wipes sweat from his forehead. It's as if the earth itself has turned against us. No water, no crop, nothing. It's like the land is cursed. Intriguing, I say cautiously, pressing the point. Have you noticed anything else out of the ordinary? Perhaps unfamiliar faces lurking about? He pauses, debating whether to share what he knows. Finally, he gives in. Look, people around here are talking. They say it's Eliza's doing. She's been spotted in the northern woods. I nod my thanks to the farmer and make my way back to where Nathaniel is standing, his face stern but focused. I spoke to a local who saw Eliza near the old ruins in the northern woods, he shares, glancing at me for my input. The same location was mentioned by a farmer I spoke with, I reply. Our corroborated information leaves no room for doubt. Eliza is most likely in the northern woods. We saddle up our horses and set out toward the old ruins. As we draw near, a weighty feeling of dread pervades the atmosphere, almost as if the very air is saturated with malevolence. Both Nathaniel and I sense it. It's as if the woods themselves are cautioning us. We dismount, tying our horses to a sturdy tree. Swords unsheathed, we cautiously move forward on foot. Nathaniel, how do you want to approach this? I ask, eyeing the darkened woods and crumbling ruins ahead. Sweep the perimeter. I'll take the front and move through the middle of the ruins, he directs, his eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of movement or danger. I follow Nathaniel's instructions and begin to circle the ruins. My ears pick up a peculiar sound, a low, haunting chant 
that seems to come from behind a collapsed section of an old stone wall. I pause, making eye contact with Nathaniel and signaling towards the source of the sound. He nods, understanding the gravity of the moment. In a coordinated effort, we both burst into the secluded area, disrupting Eliza in the midst of what appears to be a dark and ominous ritual. Ingredients for a spell are scattered on a makeshift altar, and she looks up, eyes ablaze, no hint of fear. A chilling laugh escapes her lips as she meets our gaze. Ah, the renowned witch hunters finally make their appearance, she taunts, staring at us with a malevolent grin. But you're too late for this village. My work here is done. The audacity in her voice is unnerving, but it only firms my resolve. We are here to put an end to her malevolent deeds, whatever the cost. With his sword drawn, Nathaniel lunges at Eliza, but she's quick. With a flick of her wrist, she conjures a wall of fire that separates us. I try to find a way around the blazing obstruction, looking for an opening to assist Nathaniel. Meanwhile, he attempts to leap over the flames but stumbles, barely avoiding getting burned. As I finally manage to circle the fire, Eliza seizes the moment to counterattack. She utters an incantation, and a gust of wind pushes Nathaniel against a tree, pinning him momentarily. I rush toward her, sword in hand, but she spots me. With another wave of her hand, she sends a bolt of energy my way. I dodge, but the bolt hits a tree behind me, causing it to crash down, blocking my path. I scramble over the fallen tree, my focus solely on reaching Eliza. Nathaniel has managed to free himself and is back in the fray, but she's holding her own, her hands glowing with dark energy. He parries a blast from her, but it's clear he's tiring. I finally clear the tree and close the distance. Eliza is too engrossed in her duel with Nathaniel to notice me approaching from behind. Just as I'm about to strike, she suddenly turns, sensing my presence. I swing my sword, but she parries it with a magical shield. Nathaniel takes advantage of her divided attention to make his move. He lunges at her, managing to graze her arm with his blade. She cries out in pain, momentarily distracted, and I seize the opportunity. I tackle her from behind, throwing her off balance. Nathaniel quickly follows up, looping the enchanted rope around her wrists. Her spells break, the magical energy dissipating into the air. She's bound and neutralized her hands tied with the spell-neutralizing rope. Exhausted but relieved, we take a moment to catch our breath. Now bound and powerless, Eliza can no longer resist as we begin the walk back to the village. We notice that as we escort her, the barren fields start to show subtle signs of life. A hint of green reappears on the farmlands, and the crops start to regain their life. The curse she cast is lifting, its dark influence waning with her capture. Back in the village square, the townspeople are cautious, but their faces show a newfound hope. Several villagers come forward, offering their heartfelt thanks for our intervention. As we ready our horses for departure, Nathaniel turns to me. His face is stern, but his eyes are softer than usual. You've learned quickly, he says. You're ready to work alone now. His statement is straightforward, but it carries immense weight. Nathaniel has prepared me well, and while the path ahead is filled with challenges, I realize that I am equipped to face them, thanks to his thorough and relentless training. I nod back at Nathaniel, acknowledging his endorsement. A new phase of my journey as a witch hunter lies ahead. It's a daunting prospect, but one I now feel prepared to undertake. August 14th, 1670. It's been a few weeks since becoming a solo witch hunter, but I've finally gotten my first assignment. I step off the horse-drawn carriage and into the coastal town of Portmere. The air is heavy with the smell of salt water and the less tangible scent of worry. My boots crunch on the gravel road as I take in the sights. Local fishermen stand idly by their boats, nets in hand but no fish to show. Mayor Harold greets me near the dock. He's a middle-aged man wearing a formal coat that has seen better days. His face is lined with worry and fatigue, evidence of the toll the situation has taken on him. 
Welcome to Port Mir, he says, extending a hand. I wish we were meeting under better circumstances. I've been briefed, I say, shaking his hand firmly. I understand you're dealing with some relentless storms. It's affecting your fishermen and the local economy. Exactly, Mayor Harold replies, nodding his head. The sea is our lifeblood. When it turns on us, everything falls apart. Ships have been unable to leave harbor for weeks. Goods are piling up, fishermen can't earn their keep, and people are starting to go hungry. My gaze shifts from the mayor to the roiling waters of the harbor. Waves crash against the shore with unusual ferocity. Seagulls, which normally fill the air with their calls, are conspicuously absent, as if even they know something is terribly wrong. Well, I'm here to find out what, or who, is causing these storms and put an end to it, I assure him. Mayor Harold looks at me with a mix of hope and desperation. I pray you can, for all our sakes. I nod. The situation is grim, but that's exactly why I've been sent here. My training with Nathaniel has prepared me for challenges like this. It's time to get to work. I head straight to the docks, where clusters of fishermen gather around idle boats. Fishing nets are rolled up, tackle boxes are closed, and the atmosphere is thick with frustration and fear. I introduce myself, and they are more than willing to share their thoughts. It's them witches, I tell ya, says an old man with a weathered face, introducing himself as Jeb. I've been fishing these waters for decades, and never has the sea been so unforgiving. It's not natural, I say. Witches, you say? Interesting, I respond, jotting down a mental note. Where could I possibly find them? Jeb looks around cautiously, making sure no one else is within earshot. Then he leans in closer, lowering his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. They've taken up residence in a cave, about a mile west of here, past the marshlands. Folks have seen them go in and out at odd hours, doing who knows what. I nod, absorbing the information. Is there a specific reason you think they are behind the storms? The old fisherman scratches his grizzled beard. Well, it's no coincidence that these storms started right round the time they arrived. Plus, people have heard eerie chanting and seen strange lights from that cave. Something's not right, I'm telling you. Thank you, Jeb. This is helpful, I say, my resolve strengthening. Armed with this new information, I decide it's time to check out this cave for myself. As the sun dips below the horizon, I find myself standing before the cave's entrance. It's a dark, gaping hole in the side of a limestone cliff, framed by jagged rocks and overgrown shrubbery. The sea is rough behind me, crashing against the cliffs as if warning me to stay away. I pull a torch from my backpack and light it. The flame flickers, casting eerie shadows on the cave's interior. Taking a deep breath, I step inside. My senses are on high alert as I venture deeper into the cave. The walls are uneven, with stalactites hanging from the ceiling. I start to hear faint whispers that grow louder with each step. Then I hear it. Incantations. A rhythmic chant that sends a chill down my spine. Finally, I turn a corner and see them. Three figures standing in a circle around an altar, clearly in the midst of a ritual. Symbols are drawn on the ground, and they have various ritualistic items laid out. A dagger, candles, and a book. Deciding the element of surprise is lost, I step into the circle of light created by their flickering candles. So, you're the reason the storms have been battering this town, I announce, leveling my gaze at them. The tallest of the witches, who appears to be the leader, looks up at me. Her eyes are cold, and a smile spreads across her lips. And who, pray tell, is going to stop us? You? If I have to, I reply gripping the hilt of my sword tightly. I've been trained for this, but the tension in the air is undeniable. A wicked laugh reverberates through the cave. Very well, try it, she taunts. In that moment, 
all three witches raise their arms and the atmosphere inside the cave changes dramatically. The air turns electric, thick with energy that makes the hair on my arms stand on end. Winds whip around violently, swirling in unnatural patterns. The force of the wind extinguishes my torch in an instant, plunging the cave into darkness. My eyes struggle to adjust, but I unsheathe my sword, holding it in front of me. I take a defensive stance, straining my ears to pinpoint their locations based on the sound of their voices. The darkness is oppressive, but it won't deter me. I am ready for anything. The leader of the witches stretches out her hand, and a bolt of crackling energy shoots toward me. The air sizzles as it passes. Relying on my reflexes, I manage to dodge just in time, the bolt narrowly missing me and colliding with a wall, leaving a scorch mark. Using the opening, I channel my focus and recite an incantation, one that Nathaniel taught me for occasions like this. A glowing orb materializes in my palm and shoots toward the witches. The leader, quick on her feet, dodges just in the nick of time, but one of her companions is slower. The orb connects squarely with her chest, and she lets out a gasp as she's knocked off her feet, sprawling on the ground, temporarily incapacitated. Not wasting a second, I pull out a length of spell-neutralizing rope from my belt. I rush over and quickly bind the fallen witch's hands. The rope tightens on its own, neutralizing her magical abilities. Two witches down, one to go. I turn my attention to the remaining witch. She snarls and lunges at me with surprising speed, her fingers extended like claws. But I've been trained well. I sidestep her attack, simultaneously extending my foot to trip her up. She stumbles and falls forward, crashing onto the ground. Before she can recover, I'm on her. Using another length of the special rope, I bind her hands behind her back. Once again, the rope tightens, and her magical abilities are suppressed. The leader of the witches backs away into the darkness of the cave, her eyes still locked onto mine. This isn't over, she hisses, her voice laced with malice. You've won a battle, not the war. In the blink of an eye, she vanishes into the depths of the cave, leaving me standing in a silence that's now tainted with a promise of future confrontations. Gathering the captured witches, I make my way back to Portmere. As we arrive, I can feel a change in the atmosphere. The air isn't as thick with desperation as before. Even the sea appears calmer, the once turbulent waves now gently lapping at the shore. It's as if the town itself is letting out a sigh of relief. I hand over the captured witches to the local authorities, ensuring they are securely locked away. Mayor Harold approaches. Thank you, he says firmly, shaking my hand. You've saved our town, saved our people. I did what I had to do, I reply, recalling what Nathaniel always said about our grim duty. We do what's necessary to protect the innocent. The fishermen are already making preparations to go out to sea again, mending nets and preparing boats. Families reunite at the docks, hopeful smiles replacing the grim expressions from before. Life in Portmere is slowly, but surely, returning to what it once was. But as I mount my horse to leave, the weight of the leader's words still lingers in my mind. She is still out there, somewhere in the shadows, plotting and planning. This confrontation was merely an opening gambit, and I find myself both anticipating and dreading our next encounter. April 24th, 1673. Years of experience have prepared me for challenges, but nothing quite like this. I find myself at the entrance of a crumbling castle. Vines of ivy cover the stones, nature reclaiming the once grand structure. People talk about Abigail, a witch who is different, possibly more dangerous than any I've encountered. As I hold the hilt of my sword, a feeling of anticipation surges through me. I need to find out if what they say about her is true. As I step inside, the atmosphere changes noticeably. The air is dense, almost as if it carries the weight of all the magic that's been practiced here. The walls are adorned with torches that burn in an unsettling hue. The light they cast doesn't feel like it comes from simple fire, 
It feels tinged with enchantment. I sense that I am being watched, but not by ordinary eyes. There is a force here, aware of my entry, analyzing my every move. So, you've finally come, the voice reverberates, filling the chamber and making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It's an unsettling sensation, as if the stones themselves have found a voice. Show yourself, Abigail, I command, my tone unwavering despite the strangeness of the moment. She emerges from the shadows, almost as if materializing from the darkness itself. Her eyes meet mine, and there's a spark there, a glint of something unsettlingly familiar. She looks at me as though she knows something about me that I don't. Do you even know why you hunt us? Abigail's voice is soft but sharp, tinged with an emotion I can't quite place. Is it righteousness that guides you, or is it merely the thrill of the hunt? I hunt to protect those who can't protect themselves, I fire back, trying to maintain my focus. Do you? She challenges, an almost mournful tone in her voice. Or do you hunt because it fills a void in you, gives you a reason to exist? Her words are calculated, aimed at unsettling me. But I've trained for this, and prepared myself to resist psychological tactics. Enough talk, I assert pulling my sword from its sheath. The blade gleams in the eerie light, ready for whatever comes next. Very well, Abigail says, lifting her arm. Blinding bolts of energy rocket from her fingertips, aimed squarely at me. I roll to the side, dodging the bolts and almost immediately launch a counterattack. A torrent of fire erupts from my hand, swirling toward her with blistering speed. But she waves her hand casually, and the fire disperses into harmless embers that die out before reaching her. It's clear that our magical prowess is on an equal footing, as we trade spells that ripple and crackle through the air. The duel is intense, with neither of us giving ground. Each minute is packed with dodges, counters, and near misses, making the passage of time feel distorted. She then does something unexpected. She lowers her hand and takes a step back. Her eyes meet mine. You're good, she concedes, her voice tinged with a newfound respect. It's no wonder you've become so infamous among my kind. Catching my breath, I nod. You're not so bad yourself, I reply, keeping my grip firm on the hilt of my sword. Your skills live up to the stories. Her expression then shifts to something more serious, almost pleading. You don't have to continue down this path, she urges. You're missing the larger scheme of things. There's a greater evil, more perilous than you realize. Evil is evil, I retort, my sword ready for another round. Is that the excuse you give yourself for the damage and suffering you witches cause? She exhales, her face a mix of disappointment and resignation. I had hoped you'd be different that you might see the larger landscape, she says. Her voice is filled with a sorrow that almost makes me doubt. But before I can process it, or even consider a response, she chants a few words under her breath. Then, a billowing cloud of thick smoke erupts around her, filling the space with an awful smell. When the smoke clears, she's nowhere to be found. I look down and see a note where Abigail stood just moments ago. Picking it up, I quickly scan the words inked on it. Look for the circle of the raven. You're a piece in a game you don't yet understand. My brow furrows. This is unsettling, to say the least. The circle of the raven? That name rings no bells in my years of training or my extensive studies on witchcraft and dark arts. It's a total enigma, a new variable in an equation I thought I had mostly figured out. I slide the note into my pocket, where it feels heavier than it should. My mind races, fueled by a newfound uncertainty. Could there be a grain of truth in Abigail's words? Is my lifelong mission, my resolve to rid the world of witches, truly as noble as I've always believed? For the first time in what feels like an eternity, I'm beset with doubt, and that doubt feels like a burden I've never had to bear. 
Turning away from the now empty chamber, I make my way out of the ancient ivy-covered castle. My steps, usually so sure and purposeful, seem slower, more deliberate. The weight of the note in my pocket, of the doubts in my mind, of the questions I can't answer, make my stride less confident than it has been for years. I walk out into the open air, but even that feels different now, tainted with an uncertainty I can't easily shake off. May 6th, 1675 For two years, the memory of Abigail has haunted me. Each witch I capture seems to push her questions further into my thoughts. While my tally of captured witches grows, so does my unease. People in town look at me differently now. Their eyes show both gratitude and hesitation when I pass. But today, there's no room for doubt. Based on what my informants tell me, I stand on the edge of a discovery that could unravel a massive plot, witches conspiring to topple the local government. I'm standing at the end of a plain wooden door at the end of a dimly lit tunnel. This underground hideout is far from ordinary, hidden beneath layers of earth and secrecy. According to trusted sources, this room houses the witches stirring up chaos and rebellion. My fingers tighten around the handle of my sword, its blade well-worn from countless battles. This isn't just another den of spellcasters. It's the heart of a planned uprising, the epicenter of the instability that has been shaking the region. I take a deep breath, preparing myself for what's to come. My hand moves to the door handle, and I feel the weight of the last two years press down on me, the doubts, the victories, and the ever-present specter of Abigail's lingering questions. I kick the door open with a forceful thrust of my boot and step inside, brandishing my sword. My eyes adjust to the dim light, revealing a long wooden table cluttered with an assortment of odd objects, vials, ancient tomes, and pieces of parchment scribbled with incantations. A handful of witches, caught off guard, stand around the table. Their eyes grow wide as they recognize me, but they quickly regain their composure. So... The famed witch hunter graces us with his presence, says a tall woman at the head of the table. She's dressed in flowing dark robes that seem to absorb the light around her. Her eyes are cold, devoid of fear. Enough talk, I reply, my voice tinged with resolve. I lunge forward, sword at the ready, closing the distance between us in a heartbeat. The room erupts in a storm of magic. Arcane symbols fill the air as the witches extend their hands, launching a salvo of spells and curses in my direction. Colors and shapes blend in a whirlwind of supernatural activity aimed squarely at me. But I've been training for this. My movements are a calculated dance, sidestepping hexes and deflecting curses. Years of honing my skills are on full display as I counter their magic with practiced ease. One by one, the witches find themselves outmatched. A binding spell here, a knockback hex there, and they start falling like dominoes. Some lie motionless on the ground, others are restrained with spell-neutralizing rope that I always carry with me. Soon, the room is quiet, filled only with the ragged breaths of those who remain conscious. However, one witch stands apart from the fallen, a middle-aged man with sharp features, presumably the leader of this conspiracy. He seems unfazed, observing the scene with keen interest. Our eyes meet, and I see a spark of recognition in his gaze. Looks like you've underestimated me, I say, tightening my grip on my sword. The adrenaline is coursing through my veins, but I feel the physical toll of the intense battle. My movements are slightly sluggish, and my reflexes are not as sharp. The leader smirks, opening his mouth to speak, but I don't give him the chance. Summoning the last reserves of my energy, I cast a spell aimed to incapacitate. He raises his hand in an attempt to counter. Before I can relish the moment, a searing pain shoots through my body. My vision blurs, and I realize I'm severely wounded. I grip my sword tightly, fighting off the dizziness that threatens to overwhelm me. I close the last journal its final sentence hanging in the air like a question without an answer. The handwriting ends so abruptly that I double-check to make sure I haven't missed a page. 
But no, that's it. The witch hunter's tale is incomplete. My hands rest on the leather cover, feeling its worn texture, almost as if it's charged with the intensity of the story it contains. A chill runs down my spine, not from the cool air in the room, but from the unsettling void the journal leaves. What happened to the witch hunter? He was so close, just a hair's breadth away from capturing that final elusive witch. Was he successful in thwarting whatever insidious plot was underway? Did he emerge as the hero he intended to be, or did something else transpire, something he couldn't have anticipated? The doubts and questions that plagued him, did they get in his way? The seed of skepticism sown two years prior by the witch Abigail, did it grow into a crippling tree of uncertainty? How did it affect his judgment, his resolve? His moral compass was once so clear, but the journal suggests it became increasingly murky as time wore on. Did it finally point him in a direction he couldn't or wouldn't follow? I think about the people in the towns he visited, the ones who looked at him with both respect and fear. Were they saved, or were they left to an uncertain fate, held hostage to dark forces they could not understand? Did they ever find out what became of the man who came to rid them of their curse? Or is his name just another whispered legend, the tale of a witch hunter who vanished before his job was done? And what about the witches he hunted? Were they part of something larger, as Abigail had hinted? The Circle of the Raven, the note mentioned. A phrase that implies a shadowy group with a far-reaching agenda. Was he, as the note suggested, just a piece in a game he couldn't fully comprehend? A pawn manipulated by powers far beyond his understanding? I realize I've been holding my breath and let it out slowly, disappointed. I wish there were more pages to read, and more clues to dissect. The journal gives me a glimpse into a complex, dangerous world, but leaves me staring into an abyss of unanswered questions.